David, how are you? Can you hear me? I'm very well. I can hear you very well. Hi, Pietro. Fantastic. So I can see you are connected directly from the workshop, which is what we like to see. Yeah, it, it just so happens that um, I'm today in St. Petersburg at the Raketa Watch factory. And uh, I'm sitting in, in the room where all of our assemblers are assembling uh, Raketa watches. Ochi Arashio. Ochi Arashio. Very good. I can see the watchmaker behind you. I'm sure I've seen him in one of the latest uh, photo shoots that you had. Because yeah, so, 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 so we have approximately 100 specialists working at the factory. But yeah. Xavier, who's just behind me, is, uh, is okay. French. He's French. And Xavier has Bonjour, been working Xavier. with us has been working for the past uh, four years with us and, um, yeah. and, uh, and, and he's working quite late because it's 8 p.m. today in, in, um, in Russia at the moment. I was going to say, I was going to say, was going to say. but nice to and have you And it's very both. cool, and it's very cool, it's minus 30 outside. Yeah, I know, I know, it's, it's probably better inside, uh, I, yeah. I guess, why I guess, why I guess. So David, yeah, we will explain, you know, we're seeing um, obviously a, uh, um, a completely new raketa. I've always had this feeling that Russian culture in general is, I wouldn't say underrated, but I would say underexposed uh, to Western, to the Western, you know, uh, audience like myself. Um, is there any of that in your decision to get involved with the uh, raketa, ultimately go and live in Russia and uh, start this, uh, this new adventure? Well, I always lived in England, but um, my mother has Russian origins that go back to before the revolution, that was the beginning of the 20th century. So I was always interested in Russia. And when I got the opportunity to move abroad, instead of moving to China or to the US, I decided to move to Russia. So uh, I, I worked, I lived in Russia for about four years. And I literally fell in love with this country. It's an amazing country, very nice people. Um, and also, I mean, it's very different and very European at the same time. So, um, and it's so close to Europe. Basically, I can travel back to Paris or to London in three hours by plane uh, for a you know, family reunion, for a wedding. Uh, so it's really great to live in Russia. It's an amazing country. Uh, yeah, it, it, I, I had the opportunity and I'm lucky enough to have been able to see Russia as far back as 2002. So nearly, I can't believe it's nearly obviously 20 years ago. Uh, as I was working for Richmond at the time. And mm. um, that was a time where change was palpable, really palpable, because after, obviously, the end of the Soviet, uh, Soviet Union era, uh, the, the, you know, there was 10 years of kind of adjustment for change to really kick in. And I felt that the first decade of the 2000s to 2010 was really a massive time for changing. So was it for Raketa as well? Um, in those in those days. Yeah. So yeah, I mean the, the the perestroika times. That was the eighties, and then the nineties, and even two thousand was a very terrible time for Russian watchmaking and Russian industry in general because most of the industries just collapsed. They didn't survive the the transition period from a communist system to the capitalist system. And um, well, you may know that the Soviet Union had a lot of big watch manufacturers. Like uh, the most famous were Palyot, Slava. And uh, I would, unfortunately, most of them collapsed and don't exist anymore. And, um, and, um, but today, Russia, has bec Russia is a very normal and stable country. I mean, in general, I mean, c when you compare it to the 90s, the 90s were quite terrible. Absolutely. I, I, did, not, I did not live in Russia in the 90s, but uh, I traveled extensively in Russia in the 90s. Uh, yeah. And it was, it was totally different. It was chaos. Yeah, yeah, no, I understand. I... I, uh, how can I say, I, I see what you mean exactly. And I think uh, changes have been staggering, uh, but uh, now it feels like you found a good environment to do enterprise and to develop something in a, you know, in, for, the, for, the long, for the long term. We see yeah, you know, uh, the all of my friends from the West always ask me, but I'm sure you have problems with the mafia and corruption and all of that. And... No, I mean, frankly speaking, no, I've never had any kind of problems like that. And that would um, never be my that would never be my uh, question because I'm Italian myself, and sometimes we get right, uh, right, things. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So I've never had any problems like that. It's a very friendly environment for entrepreneurs, and we've never encountered any kind of you know big problems with with with, um, with Raketa. 
I mean, basically, I discovered Raketa. Um, I, I was a lawyer before, and uh, it was very interesting, but it was a lot of, you know, a lot, lot of working hours, and, uh, and um, I, I felt I wanted to do something else in Russia. Um, yeah. And I was always surprised that Russia didn't have any luxury brands. You know, Russia has very famous brands like Kalashnikov, Aeroflot, Gazprom. But um, Russia has the potential to have luxury brands because Russia has this amazing culture, amazing history. You know, everyone's heard of Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, the Bolshoi Theater. I mean, this is incredible. I mean, Russia is a country that can, that can be easily compared to the UK or to France in terms of culture. And, you know, France or the UK have a lot of brands that are based on tradition, legacy, know-how, craftsmanship, culture. Russia has, and Russia has all of that, but doesn't have any brands. And that's explained by the fact that the, the history of Russia is very chaotic and was very destructive of brands, but the potential exists. So when I saw that most of my foreign friends who visited me in Russia wanted to buy Soviet watches, I thought, hey, there's something about watches, you know. I knew nothing about watches myself, but I started to, to, to look around and I discovered that you know, the Soviet Union had a lot of um, big manufacturers, a lot of big brands, and um, yeah, that's, that's, very how... that's very true. That's very true. Sorry to cut you, but even when I was, I was kind of into watches. I think when you start, you think about vintage watches, and then you think about exotic, you know, watch countries. And Russia always comes about for French, Italians, uh, English, Americans. I remember myself also. Uh, receiving one Russian watch that was a Slava movement that was personalized by a Russian watchmaker and the dial was made of a rubble, you know, of a Russian rubble coin. Yes, 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 yes. So yes. I, I agree with you. There is a fascination about, about Russia, maybe because it's always been uh, so much under the radar, it's so un unattainable for us, for Western people, that we, we feel that, we feel that charm, um, I guess, in a way. Mm -hmm. But you know that um, on, on the watch forum, what you seek, uh, Russia rates number two in terms of number of posts about Russian watches. Number one is Switzerland, or maybe number two is Japan. Number three is Russian watches. It has the biggest number of posts about, about Russian watches. It's quite amazing. Um, David, you know there are a lot uh, of collectors out there of Russian watches, Russian Soviet watches. Yeah. No, no, it's uh, really cool, and I know, uh, you know, we didn't discover anything when we started to get slightly specialized as the limited edition, uh, because we were lucky enough to start working with Konstantin Chaikin four years ago when uh, Konstantin was literally only known by the hardcore watch collectors, and Konstantin is now probably our uh, our best-selling uh, name, you know, within yeah, our I mean, Constantine is a fantastic guy. Uh, we, 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 I, I know him very well and I see him quite often. And, and we help each other, you know, because the, it's very sad that all of these other manufacturers disappeared because basically there are very few watch actors in Russia. And basically um, when Constantine won his prize at the, um, in Geneva, it was very good for Russian watchmaking in general because yeah. it kind of it kind of reminds everyone, hey, Russian watches exist and they are interesting and they, ha you know, they have a good quality and you should look at Russian watch. So we were very happy for Konstantin because indirectly it was very good for us. No, no, completely. And I can tell you, David, uh, uh, by the way, I just uh, thank everybody that is listening to this conversation and please keep your questions for the second part where we're going uh, to pass them across directly to David. Uh, so if you can keep those questions, then uh, we're going to answer, you know, I hope all of them. And uh, this interview is live now, but it will be also on our Instagram account later on, IGTV. And then you can ask as many questions and uh, David and I will be hands on to come back to you as far you know, as fast as we can. Um, David, the crazy thing is um, uh, the majority of people asking us about Russian watchmaking, they don't realize that, you know, it is a serious Thing. you know, the movements, the watches are actually made in Russia. Uh, can we explain? Because the, one of the questions I've seen passing through is the manufacturer is in St. Petersburg and you want to explain where it's based in St. Petersburg and how relevant the location is, you know, just to, to explain what's behind. So St. Petersburg is one of the most beautiful uh, cities in the world. It's just amazing. 
and and we're very lucky to be in St. Petersburg, right next to St. Petersburg, in a in a, in an area called Peterhof, right next to the palace that Peter the Great uh, built, which is called the Peterhof Palace. So it's an amazing location, and um, yeah. So in the Soviet times, every watch manufacturer was completely vertically integrated, which means that um, they made their own movements, their own everything. So 100% of the watches were made in-house. Oh, because they had uh, the closed economy. Yeah, and we, literally, and we literally inherited all of this technology. And the first time I visited the manufacturer, I was, I was really surprised to see that, okay, it was much smaller than it used to be. In the Soviet times, it, it, there were like more than 7,000 specialists working and they were producing more than 5 million mechanical watches every year, which is a lot. When I visited the manufacturer the first time 10 years ago, there were only about 20 people working there, very old people in terrible conditions. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, they kept the spirit, they kept all the machines, they kept the technical drawings, and they continued making mov mov uh, movements and watches. And, and I did some research on the internet. I found some really iconic designs like the Big Zero, the Copernicus. Uh, and I thought, wow, this is amazing. Absolutely amazing. On that, on that point, David, I have to oblige on the question of one, uh, one collector, Gotchaman78, because he received today his own Raketa Copernic, so I, I, I can't skip his question. And he's asking, of course, he's received his, uh, his Raketa today, he's asking, what's the service and repair strategy for Europe? Uh, do you want to touch her? Because, of course, you produce uh, in-house the movement in St. Petersburg, but are we going to send, you know, the the, the time pieces to be serviced back to Russia. I don't think so. Can we explain that? No, 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 of, of course not. Um, we have an official service center in Paris. And uh, since we, and, and we're looking for an official service center in, in England. So uh, we have a very good contact that uh, was given to me by Pietro, by you. And um, the, the problem is I'm so, I mean, I'm so busy at the moment that uh, I didn't have the time really to, um, to finalize but we will have a service center in the UK, obviously. And, and the more we expand, the more we will have service centers all around the world. Can, you, can we also clarify on that very point, David? It's not because um, I'm, I'm, post, I'm actually showing the watch that I'm wearing at the moment, which is the big zero, of course. Um, it's not because uh, the movements are made in Russia that they are uh, completely alien to, um, uh, to the current mechanical technologies any you know, mechanical movement will be, will be made of. So they are repairable, they are quite, you know, they're quite oh, yeah. standardized in that sense. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, the movement obviously looks different, uh, yeah. but it's like a house, you know, every house has foundations, walls, uh, windows, floors, ceilings, and, and the roof, but every house is different. So our movement is very different from Swiss movements, but nevertheless, you know, the, 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 the main construction is, is the same. So uh, a Swiss or a European watchmaker that will open the watch will be a bit surprised because it looks a bit different and it's organized a bit differently inside. But uh, in, uh, in 10 minutes, he will easily understand how it works because what Russians are very good at is, is making very simple things, very ro robust, simple things that work. And... Um, um, I, I'm always reminded, you know, we have a watch for cosmonauts and uh, we did that in collaboration with Krikalyov. He's, he's one of the biggest cosmonauts um, uh, in the world. Uh, and he always said that, um, you know, on, on the Russian module of the ISS, things are very simple. If you want water, you just have to use a pump and, yeah. uh, and, and you get water. In, in, in the American module, uh, there's a very hydraulic, complicated hydraulic technology which uh, quite often uh, um, doesn't work. And what Russians do is, is always very, very simple. So it's not is a difficult a movement to repair. That's a very good point that you made. That's a very good oh, yeah. point that you made. Because uh, culturally, we're talking about a very functional in, uh, way of engineering things. So is that the, the, the secret? Because I've had this question so much, David. We always say, if you want a manufacture movement, you know, a quality manufacture movement, you have to think, you know, 5,000 uh, Swiss francs uh, upwards. Uh, is that the secret for Raketa to be able to still engineer and manufacture in-house movements uh, and being able to be so cleverly priced as well? So is it because it's fairly straightforward technology and functional and, uh, and well, you know, organized, as, as, so to speak? 
Well, um, I mean, first of all, our movement is produced in Russia. So the cost of production obviously is, is, is less than in Switzerland. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, the, the movement is simple and we are not trying to develop new complications. We are trying just to have, you know, one caliber and three complications and that's it. Um, and we, we do not want to take the price uh, too high because we think that um, everyone should be able to have a nice mechanical watch, which is in-house manufactured. And we, um, so, in Rus so for Russians, our prices are unfortunately quite high, but for, Euro for Europe, they are not so high at all. And our strategy is not to take them higher. So this is a nice watch. This is the avant-garde watch that you're showing. Yeah, absolutely. This is uh, obviously a reference. And I will show later on, I have a Raketa catalog here by coincidence, and it shows all the calibers that are in-house manufactured. And also, Raketa went to the extent of even developing their own decoration patterns as well, which is a really, really nice touch. The, uh, the Onega and yeah, the Neva uh, ways are really, really uh, indicative and it identifies uh, identifying of the, of the brand. Yeah, because we're, we're super proud of our movements because it's made in-house. And so we want to make it look really beautiful. And so every movement has a decoration that uh, is linked to the, um, to the story of the watch. So for example, um, um, maybe I can just show you. Xavier, can you just show me? Oh, it's right. Oh, no, well. he's assembling, no, no, he's assembling a different watch. So, for example, in a month and a half, we're going to release the limited edition of this avant garde model that we're just showing. Yes. And yes. it will have a very beautiful avant garde decoration on the movement itself. So, every okay. movement is, has, an, has a really cool decoration. Yeah, I want to show. I want to show. I mean, this is, this is when you open a Jezabel Le Coult uh, you know, catalog, you normally see this kind of, uh, you know, this kind of. Um, array of movements of course there's no we don't want to compare that's not the idea but it is uh, surprising that for a brand that is priced at 500 pounds onwards you know up to maximum i think 1000 1200 1300 this is the array of movements and i don't know if it's feasible but the array of decorations as well that as yeah. david was saying are uh, personalized according to russian history and, uh, and russia so, so, for example, if, if you look at the, at the rotor of this movement, it's, it's black. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you look at the rotor of the next movement on the left, it's red and it's also yeah. printed. So, so this, is, this is quite complicated. It took us quite a few years to develop the technology to, um, to, to, um, to, to plate our, our rotors in a red color or in a black color. And I'm surprised that so few brands do that. Um, yeah, so basically we're super proud of our movements. And oh, uh, Xavier has just, is just showing me. Um, so that's, that's quite exclusive, but uh, we never showed it before. But basically this is the movement of the avant-garde uh, limited edition that will come out. Uh, you can't see it, I, I can't get the focus, but basically it will have a very nice um, a print with an avant-garde uh, design on it. Absolutely. No, there will be, there's so much. Today the idea is to introduce David uh, to you know, to our viewers, and uh, but we will no doubt do more, David. I would like to organize, you know, like a virtual factory tour whenever you are ready for that, and oh, maybe we can, show, we can then show uh, more in details all the movements. Um, I would like to talk about the story a little bit more, um, David. And by the way, there is one of our viewers uh, suggesting that they may be able to help you setting up a service center in Portugal, if you. Uh, I saw that. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> In, uh, in, in case. Um, one of the other, so, oldest company in, uh, in Russia, 1721, so you are celebrating 300 years of history, basically. Yeah, uh, uh, 2021 is a very important year because it will be the 300th anniversary of the fan manufacture. Uh, so it's a really quite a big event, not only for us, but for Russia also, because it's the oldest existing Russian company um, in okay, Russia. The, the manufacturer was not a watch manufacturer back in 17... No, it, it, was a stone, it was a stone cutting manufacturer. So basically, to make it really short, when the Emperor Peter the Great traveled in Europe, he was, he was really surprised by the beauty of, um, of all of these objects made out of semi-precious stones, like vases, mosaics of tables and statues. And when he came back to, to Russia, he said, I want a lapidary factory, a stone cutting factory, 
in St. Petersburg. So he created our factory in, in, in St. Petersburg. And it made absolutely beautiful objects out of, out of stones that you can still find in Buckingham Palace, in princely you know, estates in Italy and so on. And I'll make the story super short. Basically, when the revolution occurred in 1917, the demand for these kind of luxury stone objects did disappeared. So the last big monumental stone objects that our manufacturer did were the red ruby stars on, on, on the Kremlin towers and, wow. Lenin's, uh, and Lenin's mausoleum. mausoleum and mean, then uh, that's it. Yeah. And then there was no more demand for this kind of you know, luxury stone objects. So they kind of said, you know, yeah. what can we do to adapt to the new Soviet economy? So they knew how to um, cut stones. And they started uh, making uh, precision stones for the Soviet watch industry. Because as you know, in every mechanical movement, you have ruby stones. Absolutely. So they started making ruby stones, and then they started making mechanical movements. And this then was, they started making... This was making... the to 1938, no, the, the production of rubies, which is also yeah. Person, yeah. a very, very impressive feature to have. Yeah, so they started making ruby stones for the Soviet watch industry. Then they started making mechanical movements. Then they started making mechanical watches and in 1961 when Gagarin you know the first guy to leave the earth and to fly into space uh, he he went into space in 1961 Th this event was so incredible that they decided to um, create a brand called Raketa and Raketa means um, a space rocket so in the DNA of Raketa the cosmos space is really important and since then, we make racket watches, which are mechanical watches. So the link between Peter the Great and us today are stones. We, uh, it started with stones, and we still yeah. use 24 ruby stones in every single watch that's, that we produce. And can, can we clarify this as well? Because, you know, with the, with the moon watches and the story around the moon, uh, you know, uh, etc., uh, this, this is very, um, very uh, relevant because... Actually, we are saying that Raketa in those days called Poveda uh, basically was the first watch to go, to go on the moon. No, not to go on the moon. The very first watch to go in space was a Pabeda watch. So that was our oh, yeah, first watch. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. and, and, and that was even before Gagarin, even the, before the first man flight, uh, the Soviets uh, sent you know, dogs into space. And one of the engineers just took his watch off his wrist and he put it on the jacket of the watch. And, um, jacket of the uh, dog. Yeah, yeah. 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 And yeah. Um, yeah, he did it by his own initiative. So when the dog yeah. you know, came back uh, to Earth, they opened the capsule and they found a watch strapped to the dog's jacket. And they said, hey, this is not in the official list of you know, things that are authorized in the capsule. And in Soviet times, that was quite bad because Soviets, you know, it's, everything, has to be, everything has to be very official. So the, the KGB started an investigation to understand where the watch came from. They discovered the engineer and they, they nearly sent him to the Gulag. But so, so that was the very first watch to go in space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you going uh, to... But, um, but, yeah. uh, but, but Raketa has a lot of watches. In the DNA of Raketa, space is very important. So Raketa mm -hmm. always did watches um, for cosmonauts or in connection with space. And in our collection today, we continue this tradition. We, we, still, we, we still have in our collection quite a few watches linked to space. Yeah, so Raketa indirectly obviously has 300 years of history and leveraging on uh, fundamental uh, historical moments in the, in the life of Russia has always been a big theme you now for the development of your own uh, timepieces. So some are obviously not only inspired, but sometimes developed even in collaboration with cosmonauts, with the military, with, the, with explorers, and with, um, we've seen the avant-garde, which is the collaboration with the Tefakov Gallery, which is one of the most important uh, uh, contemporary art galleries, of course, in uh, modern art galleries, I should say, uh, in, um, in, in Moscow. So, uh, yeah, do you feel that with Raketa, you really have this nice weight, a nice uh, duty to keep leveraging and to keep um, emphasizing on historical moments of the life of cultural life of Russia. How does it work oh, in your... No, no, absolutely. I mean, we're, um, we're super lucky to live in a country that has so many achievements in space, uh, submariners, uh, pearl explorers, Russian avant-garde art, etc., etc., etc. 
Uh, for example, we will never do a watch for, uh, for golfers. Like, for example, there are brands in Switzerland that do well, you know, they, all of that communication is based on golf. We would never do that because golf is not a Russian sport. So all of our watches are linked to Russian achievements, and there are a lot of them. So this is why we do, Russian, uh, we do watches for cosmonauts, for submariners, for Russian arts, like avant-garde, et cetera, et cetera. So all of our, we only tell Russian stories, and there are a lot of interesting stories to tell. And of course, you, it's, again, it's not a marketing pitch. I mean, this is what I like of Raketa. Besides the, the, the marketing side, these are the true stories. The, the watch that I'm wearing, that instead of, a, instead of a 12, of course, there is a zero, which has become now one of the signatures of Raketa. That zero there has a meaning and has a relevance uh, to a, a specific episode of, you know, of, you know, involving one of the most important personalities in the 80s. Uh, yes, yes. So, so it's based on a design that was made in the uh, beginning of the 80s. Yeah. And uh, it became super popular in, 19, in 84 when Gorbachev was wearing that watch in Italy uh, during a, a political summit. And a journalist asked him, Mr. Gorbachev, can you tell us what does perestroika mean? And he got a bit confused. He didn't find the right words. And he eventually said, look, it's like my watch. OK, I'm not wearing that watch. But he said, look at my watch. The yeah. Russian people have decided to start everything from zero. And the, the, ne the next day, it, ma it, it made the headlines of all the newspapers. You know, the, Russian, the Soviet people have decided to start everything from zero. And they showed this watch. And uh, the collectors in the West nicknamed this watch the Big Zero. And yeah. since then, all of Raketa watches have a zero instead of a 12. And, um, and one day, you know, I asked one of our old watchmakers, you know, you know can you explain to me why did someone in the, in the 80s decide to put a zero instead instead of a 12 and he said you know it's just so much it's just logical you know time starts as zero you don't count 12 1 2 3 4 5 you count zero 1 2 3 4 5 every day starts as zero every time always starts as zero every project starts as zero so it's become like a philosophy of life um this and since then every raketa watch has a zero on, on instead of a 12 on the dial so there's that's really cool that, yeah there's always that logical uh, how can I say, uh, attitude and that functional attitude as well. So one of the characteristics of your uh, watches is most of them have a 24 hours uh, display rather than 12 hours because ultimately when you, when you live up north or when you are an explorer or when you are in a submariner, um, it's actually already difficult to decide whether it's day or night. So sometimes the 12 hours standard indication is useless, so to speak, no? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the 24-hour movement uh, was, um, um, was first made by Raketa for polar explorers in, in 1970 uh, because they needed a watch to distinguish day from night in these extreme conditions of uh, the South Pole. And then it was extended to, yeah, but that's, that, that's a re-edition we did last year. Yes. And yes. then this movement was extended to submariners and then it was extended to cosmonauts. And this is a movement that we continue to produce. It's not a very difficult complication, but very few brands do it. And we continue using it in uh, many of our tool watches because it's just a very useful complication for people, you know, working in, in these extreme conditions. So it, yeah. it helps them to survive in these, you know, difficult conditions. And, yeah. and uh, our polar watch is worn today by, by, by Russian scientists in, uh, in the South Pole, and they use it every single day. Fantastic, fantastic. I may have been wrong in that because I've always mentioned the North Pole, but we are, look, we are looking at the South Pole. Uh, yeah, you, you can use it in the North Pole also. It just so happens that it was made specially for Soviet polar explorers who went to the South Pole. Yeah, no, that, Antarctica. That, 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 is where, that was where my mistake came about. Actually. Yeah, so, so, so if you look at the time so, now, so if you, it, it takes you like two days to adapt, but if you look at the time now, it's, it's 10 to 1 in the afternoon. Yeah. You see, because the hour hand is pointing is pointing at at um, at thirteen. If it were a ten to one in the morning, the hour hand would would be pointing towards one at the top. Yeah, very cool, very cool. So logical, functional, hence Russian. What about this one, uh, uh, David? That I show in the two different uh, in the two different yeah. uh, uh, executions. So, so, so but that's a really cool watch. So I don't know if uh, people um, can read the time, but I'll tell what the time is. It's, um, it's 2 o'clock and 55 seconds, 54 seconds. 
Uh, no, 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 it's two o'clock, 54 minutes and five seconds. So all the hands go backwards. And, and once again, there's a very strong storytelling around this watch is, you know, so the brand Raketa is linked to the cosmos, to space. And um, in space, all the planets turn around the sun counterclockwise. And you see the, the moon at the tip of the second hand on this watch. So yeah. even the moon turns around the earth counterclockwise. Uh -huh. So we discovered, and you can check this, we can check this, this in, in, in Wikipedia. Uh, right. If you want, but it, so so we discovered that all so the natural movement in our solar system is the counterclockwise movement. So we said, hey, let's do a watch where the hands move around the dial, in harmony with the counterclockwise movement of our planets, yep. and this is yeah. what we did. It was very complicated. It was very complicated to inverse the movements in our mechanical movement. Uh, it's not easy at all to do because we um, we we changed the constructions of the very heart of the movement. And this we can do because we produce our own mechanical movement. So we can, we can change the construction inside the movement. Very, uh, so it took us one year to do it. And this is the result. It's, it's a fantastic watch. It takes you also like three or four days to get used to it. But then it's really easy to read. Absolutely. No, absolutely. Very, very cool. We, uh, we, have, we had a few collectors that chose this particular one. And uh, yeah, when you explain the story and the fact that there's only two, I think, planets that are actually uh, revolving clockwise around the sun, all the others, as you said. No, 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 no. All the planets uh, turn around the sun counterclockwise and all, all the planets, planets except, for, except for two, uh, turn yeah. around their own axis counterclockwise, you see? But all oh, of them okay, turn so around the sun counterclockwise, yeah. Yeah. So it's Uranus and uh, Venus that turn on themselves uh, clockwise. Yeah, so yeah, the clockwise, but but they I'm still learning. turn around the sun counterclockwise. I'm learning. Yeah. I'm learning. So so um, so this is a really cool watch. So for example, you go to a dinner party and you ask a neighbor, you know, do you know how to read the time? And he says, Yeah, of course I know how to read the time. He said, Okay, <laughs> what's the time on my watch? And then yeah. you can see him that you know holds the watch, turns it around, and he becomes all red because he. He's really embarrassed because he can't tell the correct time. And then you start explaining to him why it's like that. And it's, you, know, it's, it's, um, I, you engage in an interesting conversation and everyone joins in because it's, it's interesting. I love that because also, you know, independent watchmaking is all about reinterpreting time because the way we read time uh, is, is, um, is actually a standardization that we have, a conformity that we have created that has no link with nature as such. It's just our way of reading the time. So potentially well, there are so many other yeah, well, you know, but you know why someone decided that uh, all the hands should go clockwise around the dial? You know, who decided, uh, why did we decide no. that the hands should go cl clockwise? Well, it took me a lot of time to, 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 found, to find the answer, but I did find the answer. The answer is that when, uh, you know, dials didn't, I mean, when the clocks didn't exist, how did you read the time? Looking at the sun. So you just planted a stick in yeah. the ground and you looked yeah, how yeah. the sun went from left to right and, yeah. and, and, and the shadow went from right to left. So basically when we invented uh, clocks, we just, we just replicated the movement that we saw in nature. Uh, but, in it's an illusion. Yeah. Yeah. but it's an illusion. The sun is not yes. moving from left to right. The sun is not moving at all. We are moving around the sun counterclockwise. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. so, 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 so actually, the, yeah. Yeah, no, the, the, the Roman, uh, obviously, sundials were, yeah, probably uh, some of the very first uh, successful attempts to really, uh, to really uh, uh, read the time. And, uh, of course, the, uh, the Greek clepsidras were a completely different concept, and that's, uh, but that's not been developed as much as the sundial. So it's interesting to point out. Spadgan is saying, I find it easier to adapt to the anti-clockwise time reading that I do adapting back to clockwise. That's that's an interesting interesting point that reinforces what we're trying to say. Um, there are two questions for you now, uh, David. I didn't realize we already already went for nearly 40 minutes, and thank you very much really? for your time. Yeah, it's it's been it's been a great pleasure. There are a few questions. Uh, some of uh, our viewers are asking: Are you going to develop a GMT, and are you going to develop a mechanical chrono? Uh, no, the answer, the, the answer is no. And for a very simple reason, uh, we only do movements that tell a story. You see, yeah. um, like a, a chrono um, is made by a lot of other brands in Switzerland. 
And uh, if we did one, it wouldn't tell any particular story because um, like the 24-hour movement tells a story. It tells a story of Russian polar explorers. It tells a story of Russian submariners. It tells a story of Russian cosmonauts who need 24-hour watches. Uh, the counterclockwise movement that we developed tells the story of the cosmos, of the organization, or the organization of the cosmos, cosmos, which is really linked to our DNA. Uh, a chrono is, is, doesn't tell anything that's really linked to Raketa or to Russia in particular. So we don't okay. need that. Uh, we prefer to do less movements, but better movements. We prefer to do less, but better. And um, anyway, the Swiss, the Swiss do very good chronos and most likely our chrono wouldn't be as good as the Swiss or, or at least it would take us a long time to reach the kind of same level of quality. And as I said, it doesn't tell any specific story that's Russian. Do you see what I mean? So we don't need that. Uh, and Chrono is uh, underrated in terms of how complex an idea is. It's, it's, it's very difficult. Basically, we would have to redo a new, a new movement. A lot of people ask us, you know, will you ever do two beyonds? And the answer is no, also. You know, two beyond doesn't tell any Russian story. And also, two beyond isn't Russian, really. It's very Swiss, very complicated. You know, Russians are. Um, Russians do simple things that are robust. A tourbillon is very fragile, very delicate. This yeah. is not a Russian story. So there we will not do tourbillons. On the, on the GMT, we could discuss because, of course, Konstantin uh, uh, yeah. Putin has a Russian time and also he's launched the first intergalactic GMT that, that yes, gives you yes, the, time, yes. the time on Mars and it's called the Mars yes. Conqueror. So is GMT something you may be looking into? Maybe in the future, but no. I mean, in the sh in, in the short, uh, you know, mid uh, run, we will we will stick to a you know twelve hour movement, twenty four hour movement, and counterclockwise movements, and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because because you know, it's what we do is very complicated. You know, m producing your own mechanical movement in house is extremely complicated, uh, and yeah. this is why so few brands do it. I mean, this is really doing explanations why so few brands do it. I mean, basically, you can count them on the fingers of your, of your hand. So if we started to try to do something more than what we already do, we would just, you know, explode. <laughs> no, no, absolutely, absolutely. And again, you know, for the prices we are accustomed to, again, it, it, you know, the surprise is massive when people understand what you guys are doing. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we invite everyone... Yeah, everyone's invited to come and visit the manufacturer because, you know, for example, in Switzerland, I was surprised. I went to visit Rolex and they said, no, you can't visit Rolex. I, I went to visit uh, Patek Philippe and they said, no, you can't visit Patek Philippe. And so I couldn't visit anything. So actually, I've never been in, a, in another manufacturer than, than Raketa, uh, which is a bit okay, sad. I can, I, can help you, I can help you with that. Not necessarily okay. with Rolex and Patek. I, I can't guarantee that at all. But uh, I've been lucky enough to visit uh, to visit at least 20... 20 watch manufacturers really so, really uh, i'm really i'm really looking well including constantine of course in moscow so the next time i come to moscow definitely i would i would want to come okay. to Saint Peter and uh, okay uh, and but 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 anyone everyone's invited to visit our manufacturer it's totally open and you would and you know we have many swiss watchmakers who come and visit us or swiss journalists and they say hey it's amazing we we saw operations that we never saw in switzerland you know for example yeah. you know how do you make the hair spring we make the hair spring every single day and 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 we show that to them, and they say it's 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 amazing, and 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 we do it. The hair um, spring is the still one of the holy grails where everybody knows you can count on your five fingers, even in Switzerland, who is producing hair springs. Yeah, uh, I, I have I have witnessed only once one maker with my eyes, and that was H Moser. So I've seen what they do, how they do it, how long it took for them to make it in an environment, in an ecosystem, which is all up, you know, to support that kind of effort. In Russia, it's all out of your own knowledge, history, resilience and persistence. Yeah, yeah. So, so all of the material we use for the movement is, is Russian material. All this, the ruby stones are Russian ruby stones. Uh, the hair spring is made from a Russian alloy, which is very, very secret, and we keep it super secret in the safe. Um, so it's a very Russian watch by material and the, 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 the construction of the movement is very Russian. So, um, so the, if you the want rubies, to... The rubies are still... The ruby made, stones uh, are... Uh, yeah, yeah. Since 1938. Yep, yeah. yeah, the ruby yeah. stones are made in Russia. Um, and, 
um, yeah, so basically, if you visit the manufacturing, you will see things that um, that yeah, most people have never seen anywhere else. So it's really fascinating. And also, we produce it old school, you see. We don't have all of these CNC machines that require programming and all of that. Uh, we, it's, it's very still very manual uh, kind of work. Uh, yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's fascinating. Basically, we work like the Swiss worked 50 years ago. One question now, David, of course, uh, I'm interested to know, do you supply other uh, manufacturers uh, with either parts or movements? Um, are, you, are you, you know, set up for doing that? Is it in your, yeah. in your focus or not? Well, we, we did that some time ago and then we kind of stopped because it's, um, we want to focus on our own movements. Uh, so we still supply parts for other Russian watchmakers but we don't export them anymore because um, once again, what we do is already so complicated that if we start producing parts for other fat parties, then we didn't, we didn't have the resources to do that. Um, we want to make the most simple and, and robust movement. So we, we want to focus and not, and we've stopped also supplying our movement to other brands because we want our movements to be unique to Raketa. We don't want our movements to be found in another brand because this is what our customers appreciate to know that it's a mechanical movement that was made by Raketa for Raketa. And Amazing. you will, it's like, a, it's, like, it's like a Rolex movement. You will never find the Rolex movement in, an, in another brand. It's Rolex does it for Rolex. Yeah, but you could find a Zenit movement in a Rolex a few, Me, <laughs> a few yeah. decades back. But anyway, uh, no, interesting because I have another question on that one. But there is the perfect question coming from uh, Saad Vintage saying, uh, it's a question I had from, uh, from uh, I was chatting with uh, Ricky from the Scottish Watches, and he was uh, pointing out how he acquired a, a big zero from the Soviet times, and the watch was barely 100 pounds. And of course, today we're talking about, you know, five times that kind of price. We have already discussed on how before, in the past, Raketa was mass-produced, whereas now, do you consider Raketa as niche operations? How do you see, what, what would you answer to somebody saying, this used to be 100 pounds, is now 500? Well, I mean, uh, it requires a bit of explanation. When the watch was produced in the Soviet times, the watch was very expensive for Russians. Um, to buy a Raketa watch in the Soviet times, you had to spend approximately half of your salary on a Raketa watch, so it's quite expensive. But the, the currency exchange was such that this ex watch that was quite expensive for, for the Soviets was very cheap for the West. So it was sold for 100 pounds. But for the Russians, it was still very expensive. It was, it was once again half of that salary. Today, the currency is totally different. And this is why we cannot produce any more watches for 100 pounds. And also, the other explanation is you're perfectly right is that uh, at the Soviet times, they produced you know, more than seven, six million watches every year. So the, um, they had huge economies of scale, which we don't have today. I mean, we, um, we produce, uh, um, I forget how, much, how many we produce, and, but we produce much, much, much less today. I mean, hopefully one day we'll reach these figures again, but uh, um, yeah. it's, very, it's still a very niche uh, production. It's very clear. And again, then when you... When you come out from, uh, from that mindset of comparing to the past, which is uh, uncomparable, even just considering this, you know, what happened in the history of that country and all the fluctuations and changes. Um, but then you, you, you see what's there in the market, you know, in terms of in-house manufactured timepieces at what price, then you immediately you get absolutely stunned by the amazing you know, value that you guys seem to, to be proposing. Another question from uh, Don Davai, probably uh, Moscow's, uh, living in Moscow, is saying, where can I, uh, which places, Raketa, is it possible to visit in Moscow? So which, in which places in Moscow can we, can we see Raketa? Uh, so, so we have our own shop in Moscow that is right in the center. When you're in the shop, you can see the Kremlin uh, and you can see the Red Square. Um, we have a shop in St. Petersburg. Yeah. And um, yeah, so you can see... So it's in the Red Square. Yeah, your own, so your own... it's on it's on Tverskaya, on Tverskaya, which is like Tverskaya, the main street right. of uh, the main street yeah, of yeah. Moscow, right next yeah. next to the Red Square. It's yeah, it's a it's, uh, it's it's a very nice shop, and you can see all of our all of our collections, and we have fantastic sellers who can tell you all the story of every single watch. Um, 
I mean, we have people who spend hours in their watch because it's every watch tells us a really interesting story. Absolutely. If you are in the UK, of course, the limited edition is the official retailer for now. The idea is to try to develop, you know, because the, the brand doesn't need to be developed. It just needs to be more known here, you know, in the UK. And this, this is already in progress. So you'll be able to find the limit, um, Raketa at the limited edition and a number of other retailers very soon, hopefully. Um, another question comes from uh, JB Atala, 67. How is your accuracy on the movement? Uh, plus minus 10 uh, per day? Yeah, it's minus 10 plus 20. Okay. Um, um, you know, everyone says you have to do less than that, but frankly speaking, it doesn't really change anything. Um, yeah. And obviously in the future, we will try to reduce that. But uh, no one ever complains, I mean, really about, um, there's no big difference between a you know, minus 10, minus 5 plus 10, minus 10 plus 20. Um, yeah. it's, like, it's like a lot of people say, hey, you're, you know, you have eight, we have 18,000 beats per hour. And in Switzerland, yeah. it's usually like 21 or 28. And everyone's, yeah. everyone says, hey, you only have 18. It doesn't really change anything, you know, uh, when well, you understand I, exactly I, how I, it I, works. So what? if anything... If anything, three hertz is supposed to be slightly more stable in terms of keeping uh, uh, keeping uh, the oscillation uh, um, say steady, and also yeah. there will be less problems with the lubrication as well because less yeah. less oscillation, less. I, I, and but, also, yeah. it allows also it allows us to have a very big balance wheel that you can yeah. see in the back because yeah. uh, the, the the more oscillations you have per hour, that's from what I understand is the, is, is the smaller the balance wheel is and the smaller the hairspring is. So in our movements, you can very well see with the naked eyes, the balance wheel and, and the hairspring. Yeah. Uh, no, you have to turn it around. You have to turn it around. No, yeah, 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 a bit more. Yeah, yeah a bit more. Yeah, here you are. Here so are. when you have 18,000 uh, beats per hour, you can really see a balance wheel that oscillates and the hairspring that, that breathes in the movement. It's, it's very beautiful. Very cool, very cool. Uh, more questions, David, and I'm happy because obviously uh, I have learned a lot today. You know, some things I had grasped, some others I needed to, uh, to, to really clarify, and I'm really, really happy you, 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 know, you devoted your time for us all. Can you, so we said... The Raketa Boutique is, is in Tverskaya in Moscow, which is the big avenue that leads to the Red Square. I've been there many, many times. Very, very lovely place. Uh, in St. Petersburg, can you give the address of the manufacturer? Uh, what is the... Uh, you know, it, uh, in St. Petersburg, it's, it's a shop called uh, on, on the Moika. It, it's, it, it's a yeah. shop uh, called uh, Au Pont Rouge. It's right also in the center. Um, yeah. the, the these... address? Uh, it's Moika number... Oh, you, you caught me there. I forgot. No, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. yeah. But you can find it on the website. On Moika, yeah. Fantastic. What do you think about chunking watches from No Cup? From? Sorry, No Cup is asking, what do you think about chunking watches? I think you already oh. touched upon that. Oh yeah, yeah. I, 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 I very much admire what uh, uh, Konstantin Chaikin does. Um, um, obviously, what he does is very different from, from what we do. Uh, it's much higher priced and it's much more exclusive. But um, I, I very much admire what he does. He's a very nice person and um, he, he's been in our factory. Because uh, Chaikin comes from St. Petersburg. Yes. Absolutely. So he's been in our factory many, many times. And yeah, I, I obviously, it's fantastic what he does. And once again, you know, I, I wish him all the best because the more successful he is, uh, the more, you know, people will know about Russian watches and the more it will help us. And also the more successful we are, the more um, people will, you know, learn about Chaikin also. So for example, you know, uh, we, won, um, we won the third place in, um, in the competition that was organized by a French blogger, Passion Horlogère in France. So we were yeah. very surprised to be nominated. And we yeah. were not only nominated, we, we arrived in, in the third position uh, with, with, um, um, with this watch, you see. Yeah. And we were very surprised. And this is very good because people talk about Russian watches. Absolutely. So, I, so, I can only agree. Uh, um, to give an idea of the relevance of Konstantin Chaikin, Konstantin Chaikin has been recently the chairman of the Académie des Autres, uh, 
the, the création d'horlogerie indépendante, uh, which is an honor that is only given, you know, to uh, watchmakers that, uh, you know, are at certain standard. Constantin Chakin has over 80 patents in the field of watchmaking. And he's the, yeah. if you let me, David is the perfect emblem of that curiosity and ingenuity that Russian engineering is all about. Because also he's a yeah. self-taught. He's a self-taught. Absolutely. As well. Absolutely. Because yeah. unfortunately, yeah, he, he never went through, Russia, uh, uh, through watchmaking school. He learned everything by himself. And... Um, and this is very sad that, you know, for example, we've, we've had to, to open our own watchmaking school in the manufacture because every young person we employ uh, doesn't come, come from a watchmaking school. So we have to teach him from scratch. So we have to have our own watchmaking school with our own teachers and our own teaching programs. Yep. So but, it's, but it's a, what, yeah. we do, what we do is very, very, very difficult. It's very complicated. Somebody's saying here, Chaikin is a Frank Miller and Raketa is a Rolex. <laughs> if you're, mm -hmm. I don't know if you're, if you're happy with that comparison, but interesting. Um, somebody's asking me about my T-shirt. It's a Pearl Jam, yeah, to 2018. Yeah, thank you for asking that. Uh, and um, yeah, they're saying, again, people are talking about the comparison between Raketa in the past, Raketa today, but... The, the difference in price applies to every every watch brand. And somebody's saying Rolex was very inexpensive in the 80s, you know, compared to today. So there's not much that needs to be explained. It's just a fact of history that things things uh, move on and change. Um, is it easy to open a Raketa shop in another country? I sent emails and also wrote on Instagram, but he didn't have an answer. So yeah, this is your private uh, private conversation. Really? So okay. Sad, if we it, if we did. If we didn't answer, that's very bad on our part. So I'm very sorry for that. No, 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 it's not difficult. I mean, we are looking for partners outside Russia. Uh, we, we, we see very big interest for what we do outside Russia because it's very different from, you know, we stand out from the crowd very easily and people, you know, people are interested in niche brands. Um, and so we think we have a big potential outside Russia. It will take time, obviously. But we are definitely interested in you know, any kind of partnership that is interesting. Definitely. Yeah. I'm very sorry if we didn't answer. No problem. It must be from the Middle East or from uh, Turkey, could be, because Saad, Saad obviously means uh, watch in those countries. Um, yeah, thanks, JB Atala, uh, reminding us that George Daniels said that 18 beats per hour is more than enough. So we are, we are safe with that as well, David. <laughs> it's all good. Yeah. Um, yes, also Xavier uh, saying this is the traditional frequency of classic horology, so this is uh, all understood. Uh, Salut Xavier, had de te revoir par chez nous. Uh, of course, this was for Xavier. Uh, so, question from Spadgan. Any words yet on a special edition for this year's 60th, uh, sorry, three, uh, 60th anniversary of the Raketa brand and 300th anniversary of the Petro Doritz factory. Yeah. So, so for the 60th anniversary of the Raketa brands, which is also the 60th anniversary of the first manned flight in space by Gagarin, we are preparing a very you know, big collaboration with uh, Roscosmos. Roscosmos is a Russian NASA. Uh, and I will tell more about that in a few months. Yeah. But this will be a really cool watch, a very exclusive watch. Um, uh, and that will come out in a few months. Fantastic, fantastic. We're looking forward to that. Uh, do you do you already have retailers in the U.S. at the moment? Nope, nope. Okay. Uh, so, the, uh, so the U.S. is uh, the U.S. is fantastic because we 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 hardly we don't do any marketing in the U.S. We don't have any retailers in the U.S. But the U.S. has become a uh, second strongest market outside Russia, with a very well, uh, significant growth in in, in last year. I'm not surprised, David. Three of the last watches that we sold from the limited edition portal. So Goncalero, you can go on the, the limited edition.co.uk because we do delivery to the US and you'll find interesting that also we do free delivery as well. And we, uh, besides the Raketa warranty, we offer one additional year warranty as well if you purchase from the limited edition. So we are very glad to cover the US market, which is big for the limited edition. And we are seeing that independent watch making is is growing very, very rapidly. So for now, Gonzalo, you can rely on us. 
And if there would be a retailer in the US, of course, uh, Baketa and even myself would let you know, of course. Um, so there was a question that I skipped, David, which I always find interesting because depending on how much a watchmaker is a watchmaker or an artist of watchmaking, sometimes the conception of a watch starts from the movement and then from the movement it becomes a watch outwards. Some other times there is a concept and there is a style and there is a design and the movement is the last thing that actually uh, a brand or a watchmaker would think about. What is your creative process? Do you start from the movement and adapt it to, the, to a concept or do you start from a concept and then develop the movement? Well, it depends. You see, for example, the 24-hour movements, we keep it for tool watches, for professionals working in extreme conditions to survive. So we would not do a classic watch with a 24-hour movement. We would yeah. not do a watch uh, in collaboration with Russian art using a 24-hour movement. Um, uh, for these kind of watches, we would, for, for, for a concept watch, for example, a curiosity watch, like uh, uh, watches in collaboration with, um, you know, with, with Russian avant-garde art, we would start with the design and we would use a simple 12-hour movement. So it, it depends on the watch, really. Yeah, but what we definitely do is we don't do watches um, to please everyone. You know, we do watches that are true to um, our values, to our history, and then you like them or not. But a lot of people hate do say, you know, why don't you, you do watches for women because it's big market? But Aketa never did watches for women. We, they did watches for men and unisex. So we would never do watches especially for women. David, that you're touching a massive, massive um, topic that has been discussed in length on uh, Clubhouse in the last few days and it's becoming very, very stringent is the fact that actually ladies are not accepting anymore to be standardized and for brands to develop stuff for ladies and watches for ladies. So the, I think the unisex idea is definitely the future. So the gender or gender free or gender neutral. So uh, that's a very good point that you make. I have a, there's another question, another couple. So we've done, we've already gone for an hour, but uh, since everyone is, uh, is being very interactive, I hope you don't mind, David, to stretch it for another 10 minutes. No, no, it's fine, it's fine. But are we not going okay. to be cut off? No, 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 it's okay. No, no, it's okay. Uh, so there was a question in relation to um, vintage Raketa. So first of all, what would you say you have a, Big Zero from the 80s, and you have my Big Zero that I'm wearing today. What would you single out as the main difference between the two? And the second is, can you still get some Big Zero from the 80s? Because I, I really am desperate for one. So uh, the first question, there's a massive difference. First of all, um, uh, the Big Zero from the 80s had the plastic glass. It was a manual movement. So there was no um, uh, water resistance. Um, so that, and today's watches are sapphire glass, water resistant, automatic movements, and yeah, a yeah, really nice yeah. decoration on the movements. And as regards your second question, uh, it's very difficult to find a real big zero watches that have not been Frankenstein or copied or fake, because this is such a massive design. This is the most popular Soviet watch design uh, that has conquered the West. So it's been copied by everyone, and there are a lot of, a lot of fake watches out there. So it's very difficult to find a, a, a real uh, Big Zero watch from the 80s. Yeah. Very difficult. Yeah, if you see one, please let me know, because I would love to do a photo shooting, you know, as we introduce the brand in the UK and in Europe, I would love to do a photo shooting with the two, but of course the original one would be great. Um, I have a soft spot for another Russian watchmaker, Alexander Nesterenko. Uh, by the way, Nesterenko will be on our platform officially very, very soon. So I'm really, really glad. So Nordcap is asking, do you still collaborate with Nesterenko? Um, and uh, if you want to comment on the point of view that Nesterenko has on the Raketa design. Sorry, his um, point of view, uh, the Raketa redesign is pretty interesting, Nordcap is saying. <laughs> I, I, so Sinistrenko is a really cool watchmaker. Um, uh, we do not collaborate with him. Um, and it's not because we don't want to, it's just because the opportunity hasn't occurred. Um, and I didn't, sorry, I didn't get the last question about the design. No, it's saying, 
so Nestorenko's point of view on Raketa redesign is pretty interesting, but I don't know. I don't know. Uh, uh, I don't know what it is. Okay, no. so no cap if you want to re-explain, maybe we may have some, some time for that. Uh, question. Uh, so I can see. Uh, yes, so do you do uh, bespoke at all? Are there minimum quantities? Um, uh, yeah, we do. Obviously, you need uh, bigger quantities. Otherwise, it can be very difficult and expensive. But we do that. You know, we have companies who um, who want to individualize the watches. So we can individualize the dial. We can individualize the movements. We can do a special print on the movements, uh, the case back, obviously. So um, it, uh, people like the movements. So basically, we can... Uh, we can engrave or print uh, a message or the or the brand or a logo on, on, on the rotor on the back of the movement. So that's really cool. We do that quite a lot, but mostly for Russians because, um, uh, yeah, mostly mostly in Russia. We've never had any demand from outside Russia for that. But you would consider it, uh, given you know. The yes, 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 yes. Requirements. But definitely. Um, Last question, David, and then I'll let you go, is uh, obviously I know that one of the cool guys in the watch industry is involved with uh, Raket as well, uh, is Manuel Ensch, our common yes. friend, Manuel. And um, <laughs> so uh, we all know that some very cool things, you know, uh, if, you, if you put Manuel in the mix with yourself, with all what you've already done to revamp this brand, I think there's, there's a lot of incredible things that are going to happen. So are you considering collaborations with some other brands or watchmakers for the future? Because, you know, Manuel is also well known for that. Or is this something that it doesn't belong to Raketa? One, one? No, no, it does, it does. Uh, what, what we did until now is not so much collaborations. It's more like, you know, the, 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 uh, the last watch that we did uh, for, sub, for Submariners, uh, which is called the, the Leopard Watch, because that's the name of the submarine. We did that together with the first commander of the submarine. So we think uh, this is really cool because it's authentic. You know, the first commander of the submarine, a piece of metal of which we used to make the case of the watch, helped us to design and produce the watch. So that's the kind of collaborations that we do until now. Or for example, our watch for Cosmonauts, we did in collaboration with Krikalyov. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so this case is made from a piece of metal from a Russian submarine. And yeah. we did that watch with the first commander of the submarine. So that's a really cool collaboration. Yeah, yeah. and this is a very nice movement in the back. Or our watch yeah. for cosmonauts, we did together with the most famous living Russian, oh, I mean, cosmonauts worldwide, which is Sergei Krikalyov. So when we asked him, you know, what kind of watch a cosmonaut should have, he said, I mean, we don't need any complications like chronos. We don't need that in space. He said, we need a robust watch to help us survive in these difficult extreme conditions and a 24-hour movement, and that's it. So we, we did that with him. So obviously these people are not, you know, they don't have a lot of followers on Instagram, they're not influencers as such, but um, they bring us a lot of authenticity. Um, but definitely, you know, Manuel, Manuel is a really cool guy. We, we met him a year and a half ago. He fell in love with Raketa. He visited our manufacturer, and uh, he thought what we did was really, really cool, and we decided to, um, to work together. And so he's helping us a lot in terms of strategy, development, and all of these things. And, um, and uh, yeah, my question was on uh, specifically a bit more on the collaborations with other watchmakers because uh, uh, that, that is well, a little bit well, sometimes. I know, I know. So we haven't done that yet. Uh, maybe we sure. could, we've been discussing with Konstantin about a collaboration between Raket and Konstantin Shaikin. Uh, so hopefully we can do that one day. That would be really cool. Like he could develop for us, you know, really difficult complication based on the Raketa movements and we could do the design together. Um, yeah, you know, we, definitely, def definitely. Fantastic. We just, so we didn't have the opportunity. We didn't I'm have really the opportunity to do that. Yeah, sorry. I'm really happy. With Konstantin, with Konstantin, that would be cool. I'm saying with Konstantin, Chaikin, that would be a really cool collaboration. Very, very good. I can't wait. I can't wait if uh, if that happens. And if it will, we will always be on board to support it and to push it the way it deserves. So <laughs> I'm so glad we went overboard a little bit over time uh, because of the several questions that we love receiving. So thank you, everybody, for participating to this. Uh, it made it really, really interesting. 
and it was such a pleasure to have the time to uh, to talk to you, David. As you may have um, uh, as you may have found, we have still have a lot to 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 understand really about the extent of the operations that you are carrying out over there in Saint Petersburg. And uh, I think the proposition, the brand proposition, is absolutely uh, surprising. And um, the quality behind makes me think that really we are, you know, there is a there is a strong brand that everyone will have to reckon with. For the future and that's really refreshing uh, especially when you're talking about in house manufacturing so thank you so much david i hope we'll have we'll have the time to do this again very soon yeah uh, pietro thank you so much and we really appreciate our collaboration with uh, the limited edition uh, it, i mean it's a big honor for us i mean we're, we're still very young and we have very little contacts outside outside russia so we very much appreciate our partnership with the limited edition because obviously you're one of the best and um, and okay. it's a big and it's a big honor for us to to um, to be on your platform and to be your guest because um, um, it's really cool. Thank you, thank you. So and, and I really uh, hope that once once this you know this crazy situation in which we live today will be finished, you will be able to come and visit our manufacturer because you've been to Russia many times, I know, but never to our manufacturer. Absolutely. And, really, and, really and, then, and then you can also visit St. Petersburg, which is one of the most beautiful cities in the world. So you can spend like three days, two days visiting the St. Petersburg, one day visiting our manufacturer, and you, you'll have you know, one of the best times in, in the world. I'm, I'm biting my nails because I've been to St. Petersburg, but I didn't come you know, to obviously one of the, the most important landmarks, which was obviously the Peter the Great uh, building where the Rakita, the Rakita factory is, uh, is, uh, is based. Um, again, the limit, if you are interested about Raketa, we are the people you can, uh, you know, get in touch with us in the in the UK. We are an online retailer, so we deliver all over the world. Uh, but David, do you want to say what are the other retailers in the U uh, in in the European Union? Because Dondava is asking. Um, have so we have. Uh, we only have retailers in France for the moment. And one yes. will open very soon in Switzerland. So all the list is okay. on the website. And, yeah. and we, ho we hope very much that in, in partnership with Pietro, we will soon have retailers in, in the UK also. Yeah, no, absolutely. In, uh, in the UK, we're still in a position where, where the shops are closed and they have been basically since March last year in and out. So uh, we are now you know, planting the seed in order then to be able to open up a little bit more uh, later on in the year. So. And no doubt that's going to happen. So thank you so much, David, once again. Thank you for watching. And please don't forget you can send all the questions that you, you, know, you need clarifications about to myself, to David. We'll yeah. be very happy. And I want to say thank you for Xavier, who's accepted to, to stay a bit later today. Because our, our watchmakers, they start at 7 o'clock in the morning. I, I never quite understood why, but they want to start, start early. So Xavier has been sitting at the bench since 7 o'clock in the morning. And it's now 9 p.m. And he has to walk home, and he has to walk home by minus thirty degrees now. <laughs> bless him, bless him. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. We appreciate the effort, and uh, we'll see you very soon. Okay. Thanks. Bye bye. All the best. Bye bye. Bye.